Hello, and welcome to this Analyst Angle, where we're going to really continue to dig into the intelligent data platform. Used to call it the sixth data platform, but we're really looking at how we're bringing intelligence to data platforms and how it's really expanding. Today, we're going to have a deep discussion on the role of metadata involving data platforms, emphasizing its critical function in the transition from traditional intelligent platforms to really intelligent data platforms and data applications and how you build those data applications. We will dig into the industry's gradual recognition over the last decade of the benefits of decoupling computational power from data storage, which has enabled centralized data consolidation and considerations where how that metadata is actually exposed. However, to leverage this centralized data effectively across intelligent applications, there is a need to embed within the metadata the intelligence previously confined within application logic and operational silos. This process of building integrated metadata is complex and ongoing, with artificial intelligence serving as a key facilitator. AI aids in harmonizing, unifying, and activating conventional data pipelines and is envisioning for further assisting and in transferring intelligence that was formerly embedded solely in applications directly into the data repositories. That same intelligence can help data consumers, including analytic engineers, data scientists, and application developers. I'm Rob Streche, Managing Director with the Cube Research. Today, I'm joined by Gaurav Pathak, VP of Product Management at Informatica, and George Gilbert, Principal Analyst with the Cube Research. Welcome both. Uh, thank you, Rob. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, it's great to have you on. I think, again, you know, uh, we're from our Palo Alto studios here. We're continuing to dig in on really how you guys are doing some really interesting stuff that I don't think people have heard about lately. I, I know you guys back from when I used to build cubes and do a lot with kind of the heritage product that you had. Uh, but I think what we want to really dig into here is and understand is the journey from there to where organizations are today, which is really how do they bring all of this metadata together and how are they digging into that? Why don't you kind of give us kind of a high level of where Informatica is at and where you guys see metadata going? Absolutely. And a uh, lot of uh, our users know Informatica for data integration. We did that very, very well in uh, the 90s. But since then, we've added so much more. Uh, and and, and it, it's all about doing data management holistically and comprehensively. Being able to do data integration very well, but also data quality, data cataloging, data governance, master data management, being able to reach modern users and being able to do all the tasks that they want to do with data. So that's what Informatica has been all about. Uh, I've made a big transition into the cloud in 2018 and 2019. Now all of our services are in the cloud. Uh, and uh, that's, that's what we sell uh, uh, for, for data management uh, users right now. And one of the key, uh, key thesis that we have within Informatica is that having this entire data platform together rather than individual bits is, uh, and, and all of that glued through by metadata and intelligence and, and AI uh, that we are going to be talking about today. So that really is how we have changed uh, in, in the last few years. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, again, how the organizations are looking at this and trying to kind of get their data estate really under control. And, and I, I think, uh, George, we were talking about this and I think you had brought up some of the things and the challenges that you were looking at? Well, you know, the, the modern data stack sort of took everyone by storm because it blindsided all this activity that was going on in Hadoop. There was, you know, big data. And then with the modern data stack, we had all these new players that emerged to do data quality, to do connectors, to do entity resolution. But what you guys are, are doing is, from, from what we've talked about before, using AI, and the integrated metadata platform to create um, this knowledge graph that adds the semantics where it connects all those islands of metadata. Now, maybe you can take us through um, some of the challenges, you know, in combining AI 
a human in the loop and creating this higher level artifact that gives meaning to all the different parts of the metadata. No, absolutely. The things with stacks is uh, that uh, if you stack them high enough, there is a chance, and if it's not glued together very well, they can topple over uh, uh, very badly as well. Uh, I, um, the, the way we think about it is, uh, we talk about data network effects, being able to use the information, the thesis is that uh, the more the products are used by end users, uh, we understand more about them, we understand more about the patterns that they use, we make the products better, and then there is more usage. So it's a virtuous cycle that, that, keep, uh, getting, uh, that keeps getting better and better. Netflix is a great example, uh, right? They, they understand uh, all information about their end users, uh, they, they produce better content, uh, more users uh, come in, and then, and, and then the product gets, uh, keeps getting better as well. Now what does that mean for data management? For data management, that means that we need to understand how uh, are the patterns of integrating data. Uh, we, we, we speak to customers, there's this good uh, uh, story that we have, you know, and this was recently, uh, I, I was at the New York uh, MDM and Data Governance Summit uh, that Informatica ran, and we met this uh, superannuation customer uh, uh, out of uh, APAC. And out of 34 critical data sets that they had, 31 of them were coming externally. These were their know your customer data sets and uh, how the usage of their product, all of that was getting managed outside of the organization. Now, being able to understand those patterns because these know your customer providers and then other providers are not only uh, providing these services to one customer, they're doing it across the customers in the region. Being able to look at their data, and especially metadata, the structures, the usage patterns, we can now understand how these, this data is getting integrated into pipelines, what's the problems uh, with quality that uh, uh, they can have, and then making, it, uh, making that intelligence available to everybody. That can only be possible if we understand that aggregate metadata at scale. Yeah. And, and then just like Netflix, we have these big hits like Salesforce and Workdays, and these are packaged applications everybody in the world uh, is using. And, and being able to use that metadata and then making it uh, available to everybody, that really is the key. Just a, a clarification, when you talk about um, understanding how these, let's say know your customer data sets um, fit together and how people are using them, do those learnings get applied to other enterprises that have subscribe to those know your customer data sets from data providers? The, the, the way it, it works is we understand the underlying patterns and, and, and metadata and it all goes down actually very deeply into uh, what is the actual key data element uh, that we are looking at. In case of know your customer, that may be uh, the demographics, uh, the first name, last names, addresses, uh, and, and so on. We're not interested in the actual data. That is very specific to that organization. But what we are interested in is how these key data elements get moved in the pipeline. How does address get cleansed, uh, right? And then how uh, do they move into uh, analytics and AI? So our understanding, uh, what we do is we collect all of this metadata. We look at how all of this metadata moves through an organization. Uh, and, and then we apply those principles and intelligence across every pipeline. That makes it really easy uh, for, for new customers to, to Just to be integrate. clear, that means the, the process of refining the data that each organization does, let's say with Know Your Customer, you can improve, you, that you don't have to know the particular customer instance, but by understanding how the Know Your Customer data sets are used, does that make the refining process easier for future uses or future customers, different customers who are who are subscribing to that data. Yeah, and let me let me kind of build off of that because I, I think that to that point, like customer 360 is all the rage still. I mean, it yeah. has been around for years, but when other people are going and doing that outside of Informatica, a lot of times they're going and building models. They're going to go use DBT or something like that. They'll use uh, they'll either use that for building the models or maybe they start out at a catalog, like an Atlan or Databricks with Unity or something like that. 
how does how does that approach versus the approach you've taken really how does that differ and how how is it do you see the advantages of what you're doing absolutely so, so the approach uh, for us is there are two approaches to unifying these uh, uh, metadata management and then bringing it avail making it available for data management uh, tools first is a well thought through approach even before you create the products you think about how this metadata gets used whether there are going to be patterns and commonalities that uh, will you know for example if a data catalog uh, is able to look at certain data sets and say okay this looks like it contains uh, pii information now you don't want to keep that information just in the data catalog you want to send that information to the data integration tool so that when a data engineer brings that data in you want to tell them you know, there is pii you pro better mask it before you send it out to another store or maybe uh, you know god forbid another geo so in those cases one plus one with metadata becomes lot more than two and then we have so many more examples so the two approaches are well thought through from before or after the fact trying to stitch that together which can become very very expensive do you, do you look at it is uh, etl or elt is from that perspective etl elt real time uh, there are uh, five different uh, ways in which data uh, can be integrated we have been doing elt for a very very long time yeah. uh, except that we didn't call it elt uh, we called it at informatica in 2000s push down optimization push down optimization yeah. was looking at a pipeline and seeing what parts of that can be actually sent down directly to uh, teradata at that time that was the data warehouse uh, oh, of yeah. choice <laughs> and, and now any other data warehouse uh, that that users use so elt was baked in into our product for for a very long time but etl now a lot of people are also realizing that doing all the compute in a particular warehouse can become costly as well so there are certain kinds of compute that you may want to do uh, beforehand and and with uh, informatica that's possible uh, too yeah I, I think that's kind of where we come to this whole separation of storage from the compute and the execution layer and I, I think you guys really concentrate on that execution and how to get it to into the form that it needs to be to then be used for AI or for a recommendations engine. And I'm, I'm talking big AI, not just gen AI. And just, I mean, that's all the rage. And if we don't talk about it, we'll you know, get kicked off the internet or something <laughs> like that. But when you start to look at it, is that really the, where your customers are coming to you and saying, hey, listen, we're, we're strapped for resources. We need a solution that helps us really streamline the gathering of the metadata, the interpreting of the metadata, and we need AI to help us do that. Is that really why they come to you? Absolutely. Last few years, uh, uh, people have been uh, struggling with uh, getting that data uh, to humans in, in, in analytics form. And then, and then on top of it, if, if you are stacking things together, you have to write this glue code yourself. And then it probably, you know, what we see is customers become uh, experts at gluing things together and writing that code and still not becoming uh, not getting the outcomes that they were looking for but i'll say this uh, uh, right and then because you mentioned generative ai and and, and all the new things not new use cases that customers are now realizing that uh, they can use the data platforms for the data network effects and then how they change in in two ways number one the amount of data that's required to generate uh, great outcome has reduced which means that the generative ai algorithms now can learn new skills in few shots uh, rather than having us sending 10000 different kinds of examples uh, uh, to it if the examples are similar the uh, the amount of information needed to train that generative ai model is is not very much uh, right so the new thing that we'll have to look at uh, is informa information density and the marginal utility of adding new example or new instances of something similar is, is not that great. But something also more subtle is that we also don't want AIs to learn um, just that one particular example. We need to give it in a way that it learns the, the why behind it, the, uh, the, the explanation behind it. Now, the reason why Microsoft Pi models are really, really good is because the training data for it was uh, sent uh, in a certain uh, way as well. So not only lesser number of examples, but also uh, uh, the, giving the examples in a way that AIs uh, can understand. 
So that, that's how data network effects are changing. That's how metadata management is changing. And that's how we uh, want to play there. So, so let's pick up on that, that now that um, in the past, if you wanted to use AI, you had to train each model for each feature on, on a large you know, number of uh, labeled examples. Now that you've got Gen AI and you're saying you can uh, the, use fewer shot uh, training, fewer shot examples. Now, now that you've got this metadata foundation, how can AI help in the, let's, let's take the data engineer persona. So in the, in the ingest process, in the harmonize process, in the unify you know, process to build the customer 360, take us through some of the big you know, productivity enhancements and quality enhancements. So absolutely. So uh, if we take the customer 360 example, the first thing that the uh, you know that our uh, end users need to do is to create a target customer model, and they don't need to start from scratch because you know we have the learnings built from thousands of customer 360 projects to give them a template of what customer looks like, and then uh, based on that target customer profile schema model, we can already look at the metadata that we have gathered about their data sources, whether it's coming from Salesforce, their customer success stores, or all the different places where they gather customer data. We can already say, you know, this particular uh, part of customer success model can be fulfilled by this particular source. Not only that, we automate the pipeline creation between those sources and those targets, automatically cleansing those data sets from Salesforce as they come into customer 360 as well. But, and that's already available today. Uh, what we are thinking about uh, and, and using this metadata for is generative AI is, is, is such a fascinating field. And then uh, uh, if you've been following, you've seen how the context window sizes are increasing. And you know uh, some of the things are you don't even need to prepare data. You just feed it in raw and, and it, it, it's going to be able to answer it. Now, where metadata helps here is it looks at all the structured, unstructured data that uh, an end user might possess and based on the query, figure out what unstructured data sets are right for this query and feed it in raw, uh, given the prompt window size, so that they get the answer uh, right away. You, metadata then becomes like your filter of what goes in to answer uh, that particular query. You don't want PDF files that have ads in them and spam uh, in them. You, you need to remove all of those things out. You, uh, in the future, maybe you don't want even want to vectorize and, and, and send it to rag databases because you know these context sizes are becoming so well. Just feed that in raw. So, lots of uses of metadata. That's where our research budgets are are going in. Just one thing that you said that um, is suggests a pretty profound change today. When when we do data pipelines, we ingest the data with some connectors. Then there's a whole process of you know of harmonizing to get to these normalized entities and then you know beyond that to get the denormalized like data products but what you said was very different like if you want to build a customer 360 you start with that as the objective and then the ai uses the metadata to figure out how to invert that process and pull together what's relevant and build the pipeline expand on that that very different approach from today's you know sort of digging a trench yeah. So tomorrow, just setting an, obje an objective. A, a data product, and then and, and that's been another fascinating uh, area for us as well. Uh, till now, it, it's always been that business users come up with requirements, and then uh, uh, IT teams and data engineers realize what are the right data products that are needed to answer uh, those questions as well. Now, with AI, it becomes easier even for uh, I'd not say business users directly, but maybe a little bit technical business users to able to frame their requirement and us understanding what is the right data product for it. In the case of customer 360, it, 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 customer 360 is probably the most valuable uh, data product that the organization uh, will have. But you'll always need more, and then these data products can be created on the fly uh, just based on the requirements uh, that you have. But more than that, uh, right? Uh, now let's go one level meta on, on this particular problem, uh, right? The one level meta is business will have all kinds of requirements, uh, right? And some of these requirements are P0 requirements like customer 360. And then you need a full hose of data governance, data engineering, data quality to make sure that the customer 360 data products are great. 
we identify what are those requirements, user requirements, and then those data products are created by default. Everything is, is, is set up for that. But the next level ones, we can decide whether those need, can be fulfilled in, instead of real time, can be fulfilled in one hour, can two hours a day, right? So you don't spend all of the costs of, of, of doing it, and, uh, and, and you create the right data products for those as well. And when you say we create that, is that the AI that's helping assist create that, or that, that model for them in there? Or is it, hey, it, it's an interactive, uh, exercise with, like you said, maybe the, the data engineer who's going in there and, and helping build that out. Because they have, because I mean, every customer 360 is different between one retailer and another retailer versus, you know, a, a car manufacturer or something of that nature. So how, do, how does that part work where they're customizing, because you have the templates and things of that nature, and the AI, I assume, is helping build that out. Yes, and, and eventually uh, we may get to a place where AI fully builds the pipelines, et cetera. Today, that's not the case. Yeah. We definitely need humans in the loop for the planning part of it and, and, and making sure that the right models are created, the right pipelines feed into it, right sources are there as well. Uh, one of the things that we are working on with our new Claire GPT uh, line, uh, which comes out in April, is being able to create ELT pipelines just through natural language. So a human is still directing the process, saying, this is my target model, these are my sources, AI, please help me create pipelines. And then saying, oh, this does not look right, can you correct that, and so on, right? But we learn, and, and then eventually, I, I tell my uh, development team that AI is like a two-year-old right now, you know, uh, you, you tell it, give it enough instructions to put the pants on right, and then it may put uh, the right, uh, they may put the right leg in the right hole in, in, in maybe 50% of the cases. But eventually they grow up. They, they grow to be five years old and 10 years old, and, and I think that will accelerate. So, so just to dig a little deeper on that with where you're going with this and making building the pipelines, is that similar to, uh, would they say, hey, I, here's the API for Salesforce, or is it, hey, I have, you already have a connector built to Salesforce, and I've already made that connection, or how does that work for them? Because I, I, I think there's a lot of companies out there that, for instance, are consolidating pipelines and providing one API into all the pipelines, and they're doing some modeling in the background. How do, when people have some of that stuff there already, how do, how do you guys see that playing out? And I think that's where we complete the full circle and come back to metadata. Uh, it's very important for AI to be grounded in a particular organization's data estate. Uh, so that when somebody is asking a question like, what was the revenue of product X in quarter Y, we are able to answer that question very well because every single word in that sentence is rife with uh, ambiguity. Uh, product X uh, does not mean anything to AI because it has been trained on internet data. Quarter Y is different for every organization because you know some have January to December, uh, some have June to July. So, uh, so so being able to understand their business context and then mapping them to the right data set becomes uh, very important. And the Metadata Foundation helps. Metadata Foundation that has technical, business, operational usage metadata that can guide them towards getting the answer and pipelines for that. Just to elaborate on that, Gaurav, our, our, um, who's, who manages the interface for that business intelligence query where you're asking the data and, and how do they interface with your metadata? So uh, the, the AI, uh, when it is trained, uh, when we trained Player GPT, we trained it on all the data management concepts. Uh, we, we trained it on how to create pipelines better. Uh, we trained it on if you, if you have to work with SQL, uh, Snowflake, for example, what's the right Snowflake SQL dialect or, or what's the right Redshift SQL dialect and then so on. So now it has the skills, but it still does not have the knowledge and that comes from organization-specific metadata knowledge graphs that we create uh, for each organization that, uh, you know, that's only for them. The AI now, at inference time, look, looks at that metadata knowledge graph, and the user interface for it is directly with the end user, whether it's a data analyst, data scientist, data engineer, for their task. And AI manages it uh, for them as well. So, so the, the knowledge graph is basically doing the fine-tuning at that, at that level, so that it's very specific, like I call a customer, you said that this is like, if you go back to that model, customer defined by one organization is very different than how they define it. How you define you know, revenue 
is very different between different organizations. So that knowledge graph on top of the AI that is created through the metadata is really how it grounds itself in context. Grounding is the right word. And I, I, I think being able to uh, uh, look at the business context, which are taxonomies uh, that end, uh, end customer organizations already have, and then mapping that with uh, the schemas, the technical data sets that are available. We call it the semantic layer. Yeah. So every time the AI starts up, the first thing it does is it creates an underlying semantic layer uh, for that organization from that metadata knowledge graph. And everything, uh, all the queries then go through it uh, to be able to answer those questions. But just, just to clarify, um, is the end user experience this, this Claire GPT or, or is the knowledge graph um, and the, the semantics of, for the organization the schema on which their own BI tool uses to access the data. Because there's, you know, everyone has a rich visualization experience that's their own BI tool, and you know, it would be a long time for Claire GPT to match that. Oh, we, we are not, Informatica is not in the business intelligence uh, game at all. We are all about data management and plumbing for uh, uh, data. So our goal is, is not to do um, uh, great BI tools and visualizations and, and, and so on. Our goal is to make data available to those BI tools and AI tools in the right uh, way. Now for that, uh, there have been you know, approaches like creating these semantic layers through humans. We think that creating, having humans create it in a rigid manner that does not change will not scale for large organizations that we sell to, Fortune 10, Fortune 50, Fortune 200. For them, this semantic layer has to be dynamic has to be created and maintained by AI, and every time it sees new thing, it, it changes it as well. Yeah, because that was going to be my, my question, because I, I think you got people like Fivetran who build pipelines. You have my former company, Snowplow, who has you know data pipelines coming in and things of that nature, where it's all this different data, and it, you're kind of sitting there and transforming it before, before or after, depending on how they put EPL their pipeline. Or yeah, yeah, exactly. How, how the data flows through their pipelines and into uh, the data warehouse, the data, data platform of choice. Do you look at that and say, okay, I'm, norm I'm gonna go through and is the, what helps normalize customer from say the snowplow data versus the Salesforce data that's coming through Fivetran or something like that? We, we have uh, customers using all tools, uh, you know, a lot of them using hand code, uh, uh, Python scripts, etc., moving uh, data around. Yeah. Our uh, differentiation is uh, that uh, you know we think that creating a data system of record for any organization is very very difficult. You know, for for any of these things, and and like a customer 360 is a multi-week, multi-month effort, uh, right? Very very thoughtful. But our uh, USP has been always to create that metadata system of record. Our understanding of what are the important data sources? What are the relationships between them? If X is moving to Y using Fivetran or any other uh, tool, how, uh, you know, where it is moving, we collect metadata from all of these tools. Uh, uh, so our uh, metadata approach for extracting this metadata, we call it the catalog of catalogs. We connect to Unity catalog from Databricks or uh, Purview catalog from Azure. And then we bring this metadata to create this enterprise view of uh, metadata. How data is moving from X to Y uh, regardless of what's moving it. Yeah. And then feeding that into our Claire uh, AI layer to be able to do all the things that we were talking about. How much does a human need to be in the loop to start building that coherence across these islands of metadata? A, a lot right now, uh, uh, right? We, we, we need humans in the loop uh, to make sure that AI is right, uh, AI is guided properly, does not hallucinate, uh, is uh, and, and is not be behaving like a two-year-old that we were talking about earlier. But for some tasks, uh, like let's say uh, entity matching in master data management. Here we are looking at hundreds of millions of records uh, depending on the company, uh, right? And in those cases, we look at thresholds. If the AI is confident at a 90% level, the humans say, you know, I trust your judgment. After a while, after looking at the predictive capabilities of the AI, and, and they put the threshold there, anything below 90% goes through the human in loop, but as soon as it becomes 90%, uh, it, it, it becomes uh, AI's responsibility. We have automated uh, entity matching or uh, deduplication for master data management like that. 
we went from about 84% industry standard uh, deduplication, which is all rule-based. It was SSA name three uh, a few years ago. We uh, put an AI model on top of it and became 92%. After like 84%, every single percent takes a long, long way. But at a scale of 100 million records for our organization, each person is giving them uh, months and months of productivity uh, that was not available earlier. So how much of those learnings, to, to go from say 84% to 92%, how much of those learnings are applied just to that customer and how much can you take and leverage with other customers because your models are, and your rules are now better? We uh, ship base models uh, that uh, take our learnings uh, uh, across l thousands of different projects. That's one of the key USPs that we offer to our customers, this learning that you know they do, they're not starting from zero. They're standing on the shoulders of giants uh, who have already done this uh, for, for a very, very long time. But then to really get it to high levels of accuracy, we need to train that AI on organization-specific metadata uh, or and data. So in this case, the deduplication uh, thing, right? So, so we, we, we look at their data, we look at controversial examples. We say, you know, this particular thing, AI does not know whether it goes X or Y, whether it is duplicate or not. And they, they swipe left or right and then say, you know, yes, duplicate, no duplicate, we learn. Yeah, no, I, I think, it, again, when you start to look at how people are doing this, it's super complex because there's so much. But, you know, when we look at intelligent data platforms, we see it having to come up to this level because you know, as we see there's in, in the ETR data that we have, there's actually an overlap between, and it depends if you go Databricks to Snowflake or Snowflake to Databricks, somewhere between a 40 to 50% overlap of companies and organizations that are actually using both, for instance. And then if you add Mongo and others in there and Redshift, and it becomes even crazier at how many different data silos. Do you see organizations looking to Informatica to help them from, because certain data platforms seem to be good at certain types of data, and they're looking to optimize that from a cost perspective. Yes, uh, and this complexity will only increase, uh, right? As uh, new AI tools come into the play, there are, uh, I'm assuming, at least tens of thousands of uh, open source large language models that are available in Hugging Face, each doing specific skill uh, uh, really, really good, and then other new AI tools that will be coming in uh, for, for all of this. Organizations look to us to manage this complexity. Uh, and in uh, that way, reduce the cost and uh, you know the amount of overhead that will have to be spent on them. Right. So let's we'll give you the last word here. What, where do you see this going and metadata in the future in particular? How do you see this really coming together? Uh, in the AI space and data space, I think um, uh, trying to predict anything beyond six months is becoming really, really <laughs> difficult. Everything changes every week, uh, right? And newer and newer capabilities come in. I, I believe uh, that AI models become stronger and stronger, uh, right? And I, I, I think that's where uh, everything is marching down to. Uh, second, I think the every time these kind of changes happen, we ask what are the core assumptions uh, that are changing? Like with EL, ETL and ELT, uh, you know, when uh, you know for assumptions before was oh, bringing anything into a data warehouse can be costly because you know, storage costs and compute costs. So, so ETL was really, really good uh, in that. But then you know, Snowflake came and then ELT became uh, uh, the main thing. What are the core assumptions that are changing with generative AI? Right? In my mind, one of those core assumptions is that uh, we have to really uh, pre-decide uh, beforehand what are the kind of questions that we will ask. We'll create all these pipelines and infrastructure and dashboards and will only answer those questions. I think that assumption will change because the questions that uh, humans ask, as soon as a dashboard uh, is, is created, now we have new questions, uh, right? And, and, and that, that dashboard is old news, uh, right? So I think that assumption will change, being able to maintain uh, that code and, and so on, that will change. So I think AIs will become intelligent to understand what are the query patterns, create those data pipelines, optimizing for cost, performance, accuracy. And then that will be a really, really good world to live in. Oh, I, I, I agree. I, I think we're, we're going to keep on this. And I, I know we're actually going to be at your event in a couple months here uh, awesome. out, in, out in Vegas. So really looking forward to continuing this discussion because I think that uh, when organizations are really looking at it, metadata is the glue.
I mean, it, it's the glue that brings together the intelligent data platform. And I think that federated metadata is super important. So Gaurav, thank you for coming on board. George, thank you for helping out because I, I, again, I love how you think about these things and just drive to the drive to the thread in there. So, but thanks for coming on. Uh, Rob and George, thank you. Excellent thanks, conversation. Yeah. And thank you for watching this episode of the Ana Analyst Angle and stay tuned for more on intelligent data platforms on The Cube, the leader in high-tech enterprise analysis and coverage. Thank you.